So welcome. Uh, thank you for inviting me. We have a very interesting panel today. Uh, these are six very different entrepreneurs. I'll introduce them briefly. Tom Serres from Rally, uh, Social Impact. Um, we have, um, uh, let me read them. Charles Barnett from Crowdfunder, uh, which is in the financial space. We have Jeff Schumacher from uh, Wilshire and Axon, which is a digital design firm. And please, guys, correct me. I'm going to give you 20 seconds to, to tell us a little bit about your companies. We have DC Crenshaw, who's in uh, Wences Tequila, Ricardo Cacique in the telecom and internet industry, and uh, Jeff Schumacher, uh, no, sorry, and uh, Thomas Kineshanko from Habitat, which is in sustainability and clean tech. So if you, if you could start, uh, Tom, just telling us in 20 seconds what Rally does. Yeah, so it's pretty simple. Uh, share your story, raise money. Rally serves a little over 3 million users now who have launched uh, roughly about 20,000 rallies, as we call them, and helped move roughly about $300 million towards causes that matter. So it's been a pretty exciting adventure. Perfect. Chance. I'm the founder and CEO of Crowdfunder. We're crowdfunding for businesses. So we spent the better part of the last 18 months helping pass legislation in the US uh, that allows for investing via crowdfunding, uh, but we're focused on all types of funding in instruments, um, and we service small businesses, startups, and social enterprises. Jeff, please. Uh, Jeff Schumacher, Managing Director of Wilshire Axon, who just, uh, as of yesterday, got acquired. So uh, I'm now uh, yeah. <laughs> unemployed. <laughs> Thank you. So we are, we are now Booz Digital. We've been acquired by Booz and Company. Uh, and we go from a small boutique in Los Angeles to a global uh, digital firm that really takes what you think of a McKinsey, uh, a design agency, and a, an Accenture and put it all together. And we work in corporate America and we build digital platforms. Thank you. DC. I'm DC Crenshaw. I'm a co-founder, co-owner, and uh, chief marketing officer of Wands and Spirits. Um, we are launching a new ultra premium tequila called Wanza's. Hopefully you guys will be able to indulge uh, sometime this weekend. Uh, my background is um, I'm a food and lifestyle entrepreneur, but we're using technology actually to help um, launch our tequila as well. Hey, Wanza's, by the way, uh, Wanza's tequila, we have 35 cases coming, right? Yes, we do. So oh. everybody gets a case. You get a case. You get a case. Beautiful. <laughs> Ricardo. Hi everyone, I'm Ricardo, uh, co-founder at Fontacto, uh, the Google boys, uh, but for Mexico, for business in Mexico and Latin America. Basically, we help uh, small businesses to sound more, much more professional, like much bigger companies, and uh, be able to take their business calls anywhere, just in a very tough industry. And Thomas. Thomas Konchenko from Habitat Enterprises. We built a portfolio of carbon credits um, over the last five years, and we sold it, and we've been using the funds to focus on uh, products that help get capital into renewable energy projects. So we um, have a couple of projects. We have GridBid, which is a roof auction, where people actually auction their roofs online um, for solar. And then the, we've spun that out as a separate company. And the focus now is something called Power Lend, which is aiming to, it's a fund, and it's aiming to address um, sub $30 million uh, renewable energy installations, solar energy efficiency wind. So the first question I got for you guys is, where does the startup idea emerge from? I mean, how? How do you get inspired? Where does the inspiration come from? So, I don't know, would you like to take it, Tom? It's pretty easy for me. I just got really pissed off. <laughs> um, I started in the American political system. Uh, got really upset about actually um, a woman that was running for judge, uh, county judge in Austin, Texas. Uh, an amazing woman that you know really captured my heart and decided to run her political campaign. And the party establishment had wanted nothing to do with it. Um, which is really interesting, because Mike was talking about the poor immigration issue. And uh, she was a Hispanic woman running in the Republican Party. And clearly, they were not paying attention. <laughs> um, but after that experience, and you know, not enough sort of people coming out to support this woman, I said, I'm just going to go build a technology platform, and I'm going to completely overhaul the entire American political system. 
and that was sort of my plan. And I didn't really know what else I was going to do from there, but kind of went that direction and pivoted a few times and kind of grew it into um, being able to power all the way up to the presidential election this year. A so, thunder, thunder lizard. I'm attempting to be a thunder lizard for Mike. <laughs> uh, Thomas? So the, I guess the roots for me of where um, sort of entrepreneurial vision comes from, I think I, I totally agree with Mike in terms of um, a deep, deep intuitive understanding of some sort of um, both a problem, so something in the world that really needs solving, and a way that you can solve that using a technology that's going to really fundamentally change things. Um, so the businesses that I've tried that have failed, that have not worked, have always come from sort of a, a superfluous understanding or a weak understanding of both of those things. And the ones that have worked have come from this deep understanding of um, this is a problem that really needs solving. And if we solve it, that's really going to matter to the world. And here are some technologies that um, I know if we put these together in the right way, we can uh, create something that can solve a problem. Let's move to directly to tequila. <laughs> well, I'm, 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 a, uh, I'm a, a guy that kind of has a lot of ideas. I'm a big thinker, um, like Mike was saying. You know, and I, uh, you know, I love to hear ideas that people have. And uh, I, I guess um, you know, my vision always comes from uh, maybe the, there's, a, there's a need out there that needs to be filled and no one has thought about it. And, um, and so if I kind of identify something like that, um, I try to come up with, you know, a way of, of how to solve that problem and, um, you know, and, and I actually implement or, you know, kind of develop something to um, obviously to, to, to solve the problem but also to make money. So um, my, I, I started a company years ago, but um, one of the things that uh, I started in Chicago when I first moved there um, was a company called FET. Uh, F-E-T-E, which means to celebrate a special occasion in French. And uh, I developed this passion for, for dining from being in the pharmaceutical industry. And my whole goal was to, when I moved to Chicago, there were so many great restaurants that opened in Chicago and no one knew about. And so my whole thing was to introduce those restaurants to, to people. And, um, and that's kind of how I got my, my start on that level. And then it's kind of evolved from there. Please. Um, I think it's a you know, you're solving an unmet need. Uh, so Google, I need to find something. Facebook, I want to meet people, find my friends, unmet needs. And f for us at, uh, at Booz Digital now, it's, it's companies that need to build out digital capabilities, platforms or businesses. And typically what exists out there today is a McKinsey will do your strategy. A design agency may develop an idea for you, but it lacks the strategic vision. An operations firm may build it for you, but then you lose the IP. We kind of build it all together and deliver that back to, to companies. And we find, uh, you know, it's uh, in, the, in the space of digital right now, there's just a lot of disruption going on. It's top of most CEOs' agendas. Uh, and there's uh, a clear white space out there. So we're, we're filling it, and that's where our, our growth is coming from. Ricardo, please. Well, it all started from frustration. So when we started our first business, uh, we, uh, we didn't have an office. So our office number was my house number. Uh, but there was a problem. Sometimes my mom used to pick up the phone and yell at me, Ricardo, you have a customer on the phone. <laughs> so we were frustrated because in the US you had the Google Voices, the Ring Central, the Grasshoppers, but not in Mexico. So it was like, okay, and then we solved it for ourselves. But then after frustration, came just as you said, the observation, the identifying an unmet need. We started uh, at a business incubator on our university, and we discovered that other entrepreneurs on the uh, same condition that we were started asking for the same. So it's like, okay, we were frustrated about it, we solved it, and we identified that someone else needed it. And then we, we saw that it was a huge opportunity, so that's how it all started. And Chance, please. I guess I'll peel back the onion a little bit on what everyone's collectively said and, and drill down into what they're saying of solving a unmet need and having the passion and seeing a clear market opportunity, which is the companies that really succeed, the entrepreneurs that become great, 
are people who know how to go several layers deeper into what they're doing than most other people can think through. And what that allows them to do is to put themselves in the mind of a person who is their customer and to really understand on a nuanced level what the solution is, what's going to happen that's going to solve that person's problem. And that is very simply what I call adding value to a human's life. And you could do it in very simple ways by making someone happy or being nice to them, or you can do it in very complex ways by solving their business needs, whether it's, in our case, raising funding for your business or for other people, how do I communicate effectively across my entire customer base? So for Crowdfunder, uh, and for me, I, I've had several ventures, several successful and a couple really not so successful and expensive. Uh, and I think if you talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, they'll eventually admit that, let's hope. Um, you know, it started for me in, I was an entrepreneur that had bootstrapped a couple companies and been successful, and I thought that made me hot shit, sorry, sorry to say it. And, uh, and I went out to raise some money for my third venture, and I was forced into understanding the reality after six months of failing that fundraising is a different skill than being an effective entrepreneur. And uh, if, who's here has tried to raise money before and failed? Yeah. So it's a challenging process, really challenging process. So I actually got involved in crowdfunding legislation when I read the story of three guys who had raised uh, collectively among them $87 million for their ventures. And uh, they had returned, they had to exits, uh, return that money to their VC several times over. And they had a new venture and come 2008, they needed some additional capital and went to the same VCs that had funded them and those people left them dry, high and dry and their business died on the vine. And they were so pissed off about that and they didn't understand it. And granted, it was a tough time in the market in 2008, um, but they actually took that energy and rather than just being pissed off and disenfranchised, they created a framework to change investing. And I read about that, I saw what they were doing, and I called them up and said, hey, uh, I know what you guys are talking about here and I know it's a huge problem and I think there can be a better solution, let me get involved. And you know, I think it was a bit of luck, a bit of the right timing, and I saw the market opportunity alongside what was happening here to, to build that. But I had seen so many entrepreneurs fail. I had seen my future customers experience that pain, and I was also a person who had experienced that pain. So I think a lot of times entrepreneurs are also the people, they're, they're building a product for themselves, and that can be an opportunity, and it can also be a real danger, because you get high on your own supply thinking you know everything about what your customer wants. Okay, um, so we've talked a little bit about where the inspiration came from, and, and uh, the next question I have, I, in, in, my, in my experience as an entrepreneur, starting a business is easy. Uh, what are the, the main challenges that you guys have found in scaling the business, in, in growing it? And please jump in. People. <laughs> People. Uh, I, I guess I spend more time around a lot of VCs and angels, and maybe I'm a little jaded, but my viewpoint is switched from money is hard to raise to money is the commodity in the world and there's lots of it. And people do the hard work as funds to organize capital that wants to be put into play. So what those people see is the challenge is not money. They have money in their pockets. The challenge is finding great entrepreneurs and the challenge then trickle downs from, from that entrepreneur who could get funding or might be worthy is how do I build a great team? Um, so if you have an idea, you have a framework for business, you have some traction and you have some revenue, Getting that to scale is the thing that investors want to see. And to do that, it has to extend to bond well beyond your understanding. So how can you build an automated system? Do you understand a technology framework for scaling your idea? And do you understand how you scale yourself as a human being? Uh, that, I think, is one of the fundamental challenges of entrepreneurship that a lot of people don't understand on a, on a really experienced level until they're forced to fail at it several times over, whether it's through technology systems or as a manager. And uh, unfortunately, there's not really great management tools out there anymore. Like you can read Peter Drucker and learn about the effective executive. Like there's really great basic tools, but there's, there's no lean startup for management. And I think there should be. I would just sort of build off that and say um, that there's, there's a lot of pieces, I think, to that. I think there's a million and one ways that there's a lot of different things that can inhibit scaling and make as many mistakes you can make along the way. And I know that for me, many of the mistakes that I've made earlier, I started um, into entrepreneurship when I was about 20. And the, um, 
the things that I did wrong as CEO and founder are, I think, in large part, solvable. So we had, in the at first business, we figured out an innovation, we had some customers, we, we had something that people wanted, and it was in demand. Um, and then we proceeded to make a whole bunch of mistakes with hiring, um, not firing fast enough, and a lot of pretty sort of, I would say, typical management things that people had been through and solved before. So um, a lot of that, I think a lot of the scaling problems can be solved by surrounding yourself, especially as a young entrepreneur, with the right people. So building the right uh, advisory boards, building the right boards, and people who've been there and done it to uh, sort of help you not make mistakes as a young entrepreneur. Jeff, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we were, we were uh, supply constrained. That's, that's, uh, that was the big issue for us. The, the work that we do, we're very close to our clients or our customers. So for us to grow, um, we had demand in London, Mexico City, uh, San Francisco, New York, Boston, uh, Shanghai, and Tokyo. Uh, that's, the gro that's the demand we have currently today. And we were sitting there in LA. Uh, impossible to serve all that and then started to get into commercial real estate which I'm not very good at I can't even buy houses so trying to open offices was slowing us down and uh, so we looked for a partner uh, to help us grow quickly uh, when we started to look at partners all the partners wanted to buy us and then we started to go through that that uh, that process and we found that right now that there's such a white space in what we do to go out and claim the space, be first to the space, similar to what Accenture did in 97 with you know, systems and technology. Uh, that led us down to the, the path to say, well, let's, let's get acquired and then light, be able to light up all these offices instantly and we can focus on what we're doing versus getting, getting entangled in all the other processes, which I think is similar to what, and I sit on a lot of boards uh, of startup companies, it's the growth, the, the people is one for sure. Uh, but then you get in, entangled in payroll and all of these other things that are inhibiting you to allow your business model and your and your and your and your strategy to grow. So if you can find the right structure uh, to do that, you can grow quickly. And we found the right one with Booze, and now we're going to be you know instantly one of the largest digital operations firm in the world. Uh, and uh, so that was the right mix for us, but it was the right structure. And I think it comes back to as you start a start to uh, start to grow it's getting that structure right from a management team to uh, the, the go to market model all those things thinking through those and the right partnerships advisors uh, definitely help and uh, Ricardo I'd love to hear a little bit about the Mexican vision of this uh, well the thing is uh, I would say it's about validation uh, not only uh, as, as from the early stage you have to validate your market and so on but to scale uh, you have to you have to validate uh, you know that the team you have for example we at Fontactor we learned that uh, the team that built the MVP the minimum viable product to uh, you know like the early stage version of Fontactor might not be the team that will scale this as a like multinational company so we had to validate how we we come from a technical background so uh, we have to figure we had to figure out the other areas of the business, as you said, you know, we have to be, uh, we have to open an office in a different country. Uh, we have to figure out what's going to be like the right tax structure. How this has, how how can this work in Mexico? Because and, and there are so many challenges, uh, especially uh, from the uh, uh, the team standpoint, because you cannot iterate as fast, right? It's like you cannot just like test and and try. Uh, talent to see if it's if he's gonna make a right fit you have you have to jump into the pool and uh, make an assumption and uh, well based on your intuition and see well I think this is the right team at this stage and based on results try to iterate and move to the next step but that takes time and if you uh, park for a long time on that and you made a bad decision that might take your company in the wrong direction so yeah so guys, if you, if you had to pick, what is the single most important factor in fostering an entrepreneurial vision, in generating an entrepreneurial vision in yourselves or in somebody else? Um, I would say, you know, I, for me, it's 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 uh, it's about passion. You know, it's about um, you know, you know, really having the passion to. Uh, have, uh, about, about your idea and bringing it forward and making it happen because I think there's so many people out there that have ideas 
And you know, people approach me all the time about great ideas, but they don't have the passion or um, you know, the fortitude to move forward and make it happen. Um, you know, you have to, if you have, your, if you have an idea, you have passion about your idea, you have to be passionate enough about it to, to really try to make it happen. Yeah, I think I have come to the conclusion that probably the most important virtue you need to have is courage. And I think that the primary reason is, you know, when you're thinking about whether it's passion, the courage to follow your passion, courage to have good integrity, courage to edit your teams quickly, courage to grow and scale as an individual, try new things, change your plans. I've really come to believe that that one particular virtue um, really kind of fuels everything uh, as an entrepreneur. Thomas? I think I would describe it as doing something that you can't not do. And then taking that feeling, which passion is a, is a good way, I think, to a way that a lot of people encapsulate that feeling or that notion. But then taking that out there and saying, OK, I, I can't not do this thing. But also, is there, is it? it is needed in the world. Do people need this thing that I can't not do? And um, is there a big market for this? And is this something that can be built with technologies that are riding a really interesting exponential trend? And so I think it's, um, it's kind of like a courageous approach to passion where you say, I can't not do this. I'm so passionate about it. But what does it, what does it mean in the world? And um, sometimes you might say, oh, but you know, maybe this market isn't that big right now. Um, oh, I care about this. Maybe I shouldn't do it. Um, but maybe you just you still need to do it and you think the market will be big in the future, so you just have to take that leap. So. I think you asked more about entrepreneurial ecosystem, so maybe I'll answer that question. How do you foster an entrepreneurial ecosystem? And I think th at the very core of that are success stories and successful entrepreneurs. Like without that, without people to emulate, to sit next to and talk to, to learn as an early stage wannabe entrepreneur. Like everyone goes through that stage. Uh, and to grow an entire ecosystem, there's a lot of other pieces. There's investment, there's education. Um, but a lot of stuff flows from that one thing. Can you have one or two people who have a large success that attract attention, that attract capital, that attract a name? Um, and get those people engaged in sharing their story. Get them mentoring other people and let people start ripping off exactly what they did pieces of it. Uh, that's what the people who I see accelerate in scale and do really well in business, they aren't afraid to say, that works, I'm going to try that. How did that work? Hey, let me ask you, how did you do that in your business? Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go try that for 90 days. Um, so in, in, in an ecosystem, like that has to happen, else you're not going to have the failures and then subsequently the successes. And from that activity is going to come attention from investors, is going to come media attention. I think that's at the core of it. So success stories and a couple of great entrepreneurs. So let's stories. go in the opposite direction. What, what would you find is the biggest deterrent or inhibitor to creating an entrepreneurial vision, for example? Anyone? Rules. <laughs> yeah, fear. Rules, fear. Lack of confidence. I think complexity. Uh, you know, Steve Jobs once said, simple but beautiful. Uh, our kind of model in the work that we do, we say simple but disruptive. If you keep it simple, a lot of people will use it. Uh, and, if, and if it's disruptive, there's value to be created. I would say your own emotions because being an entrepreneur, it's 99% it's it's emotional. Sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down. And if you're able to dominate your fears and, you know, like stand up again after a major failure or a small failure that if, if you're able to beat that, that, that that's my deterrent. Yeah, I think it probably has a lot to do with something that Robin discussed and echoed, which was just the lack of cooperation. And I think that's usually the biggest inhibitor, it, mainly because everyone's so competitive, they don't want to cooperate. But you have to if you're gonna create an ecosystem. I guess I would just add to that, uh, in, in, in especially in the Latin American context, um, shame of failure. So many projects um, by nature are good bound to fail. Some are bound to really succeed, but it, you just have to keep trying things that really matter to, to in the world that people need solved. And um, if you have an environment where you, it's not cool to fail, I think that's a major inhibitor uh, around the world to entrepreneurship. 
Yeah, I would add to that really quickly and say, you know, the three words that entrepreneurs don't say often enough are, I don't know. Uh, in fact, when investors ask them a question, they want to, investors know this is happening. They see it right in front of them. Oh, I think that the market will do this. And they know they're lying and the investor knows they're lying, but everyone plays the party. Um, say, I don't know more often and you'll actually get to learn something. And I think that's a big inhibitor that, that people either are afraid of failure, afraid of looking stupid, um, which is sort of, they're afraid to learn. Yeah. Now, taking advantage, we have people from California, we have people from Illinois, and now from Mexico. I'd like to know a little bit about the support networks that you've identified. Uh, what, what really has helped or hasn't, depending on the case, uh, regarding the network that surrounds you? And uh, what, what do you think helps your business move forward? Talking about the entrepreneurial ecosystem and the network. Well, in, in, in my case, I, I guess networking is what I, I started to do. That's, that was like my core focus when I started my company about 13 years ago, um, building a, a, a great network. And, you know, you know, through building that great network, I mean, I, I, I was, well, when Barack Obama was state senator, Barack Obama, uh, before anyone knew who he was, um, he was already in my network. And I actually introduced him to my network, which helped him get elected to the United States Senate. And then he forgot about me, so. <laughs> but but uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but uh, uh, I, I, you know, building up a, a network of diverse diversity. So, um, you know, people that, um, uh, you know, that are maybe in the technology field, people that are in the, the hospitality field or whatever type of field. I, uh, I think if you have a diverse uh, amount of folks in your network that you can rely on or, or talk to or call on to give you some advice or to sit on your board um, to, uh, you know, to steer you in the right direction, um, I think you know, that's helped me um, you know, really move forward and, and do things in a, a correct manner to help me maybe not make as many mistakes as I, as I would have. Anyone else? I would just echo that. I think uh, the mentors and networks. I've I've got great mentors, and before I did this, we did a we did a turnaround, a private equity turnaround company. So we, and we got done. We exited that, and uh, I was ready to jump right back in. And uh, mentor of mine was John Donahoe at uh, eBay, and he said, Jeff, you need to take time to reflect, uh, and think about what you want to do next, and use your network to help. You know evolve your ideas, and uh, that, was, that was quite helpful as, as we went through. So it's that network of, of, of mentors that I have, but then it's also surrounding yourself with, with ridiculous talent, as I call it. Uh, and the team that I have working with me is some of the best talent I've ever had, uh, and they're you know, better than me in a lot of ways, and putting that dynamic talent together creates you know, distinctive output. So. No, it's, it's very clear to me that in the US, I mean, there's many elements and, and, and a lot of support networks for entrepreneurs. So I'd like to hear the Mexican view. Uh, well, if you would have asked this question two years ago, it would have been a rant, okay? Because this ecosystem, this network is really new. In the past two years, we've seen WIDA, we've seen Mexican VC, we've seen the Arise of Endeavor. So it's, 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 a, very, it's a very new uh, ecosystem. And on top of that, we come from a very technical background. So to come out of that shell and actually say, okay, someone has to do the networking job, someone has to do the CEO job and go there and establish partnerships, go out there and talk to people. That's something that many uh, tech entrepreneurs that are computer science engineers struggle to do here in Mexico. And the other thing uh, that is very different than the US is that uh, before we knew uh, the ecosystems like Endeavor, we were complaining because there is a huge gap uh, between uh, the big successful business people like successful companies and enterprises there is a huge gap between these people and uh, the next generation of entrepreneurs who is starting so what is what which what is different to the US that that generation of entrepreneurs is not only mentoring the next generation but also funding that doesn't that didn't happen in Mexico I, I, and you know this very well because you, you started like Mexico.com and so on, and uh, 
who was there to mentor you? I don't know. The reason I'm asking is because I'm the moderator. So, yeah, so I know, I know. <laughs> I mean, if you don't mind me, like, you know, I started our company in Austin, Texas, and I, I would have to say while there's this appearance that there's a ton of support networks in the United States, it, there's a big difference between Silicon Valley and the rest of the United States. Like if you're building a company in western Nebraska, the likelihood of you having a support network is pretty slim, right? So, and I think that's a really sort of big thing to think about as an entrepreneur. I just didn't care, I built my own network. I went out and found my own mentors. And I think that that's, some, that's a skill that an entrepreneur has to have, is to actually go out there, identify, self-select, and build your group of mentors, personal advisors, and people who generally want to help you succeed. Um, and that's, that's just the skill you have to have. And, I, and I'm, I'm sorry, by the way, I'll go with you in a second, but you're Canadian, right? So we should hear that vision as well, but go on. I want to talk a little bit about Mexico. Uh, you know, I've been spending more time here as an entrepreneur the last year, year and a half. We're, we're launching Crowdfunder MX here. Uh, so maybe have an outsider's point of view, a wannabe insider, uh, which is, you know, I think the things, the first things that stood out to me and what people admitted very clearly is there's not a culture of entrepreneurship here in Mexico in the same way that there has been in the U.S. In fact, you have the Ad Council with the Pepe Antonio campaign here. So they're actually trying to show what an entrepreneur looks like who's not a greedy businessman. Like you have some areas of trust to overcome here. And so what happens in the U.S. is there's not that negative effect of what an entrepreneur is. In fact, for better or for worse, it's lauded as like the coolest thing. Like, oh, you're this freewheeling, creative, go get it type of person, and, and that's really respected, if not admired, by a, a lot of people in the culture. Whereas in Mexico, it's a, a guy in a suit who doesn't care and like turns his nose up to people, uh, and that's got to change a lot. And I think of what that speaks to is trust. And when you have trust in an ecosystem, you have people willing to give stuff for free because they know it doesn't cost anything, and they're not worried about exactly what they get back. They're they're just they care about sharing the value, and they know it doesn't cost anything if they've learned a lesson to pass that on to someone else. Um, and so when that starts happening, which I, I see it's happening a lot, like this is a really great ecosystem. I feel really fortunate to have come in into it in the last year at the time where it is right now and to watch that trust develop. Uh, and that trust is more quantifiable than just personal relationships too. Like to see more equity deals happening that's not debt in the investment world is trust. Um, so I, I think that's a core part of it. Yeah, I would like to add something that totally agree with you and there's also a cultural barrier so uh, when we graduated so we were uh, part of the first generation of the incubator from students we, are, we were the only company that survived out of 25 because there is a huge cultural bar barrier so I remember my uh, like my family your own family was like oh what are you doing you're you're graduating next year uh, next semester what are you doing well I'm an entrepreneur I'm setting up a company okay so when are you gonna get a real job so your, your own family, because this is a concept that is not very, it's, it's not like you know, entrepreneurs becoming superstars and you know, huge companies. We need, we need more success, success stories here in Mexico so we can change the mentality. So, so I'd have my grandma tell me, like, okay, we are, you're gonna get a real job, right? Yeah, it's, it's funny because it, that we just opened up a subsidiary in Berlin and like the German culture is totally the exact same way. Like if you ever try to hang out with a German banker, it's banker. It's like the absolute worst ever. They didn't have any idea what to do with me when I rolled into the went into their offices. It was really funny. So yeah. the view, the view from Canada. I've I've seen my network evolve into three distinct categories over the years that have, it's and it's becoming increasingly more useful to me. So, the the first category is the the business network, and the magic of entrepreneurship that I've found is you can go out and have a crazy idea of something that you want to do and give to the world, and people will just rally around that idea. Um, I didn't pay him for that. Yeah. Nice you plug. Told me to, you paid me to say that. In, in this incredible way, though, and, and so many of you have probably experienced this, you just, you have a crazy idea, you, you go out and start doing it, and people really support you in a way that you just didn't think was um, like it, in, proportional to who you are or, or what you've done in the past. So, if you are starting something in a particular industry, I think it's about going out and building um, a network of the best possible people to support that business. And the business is gonna need a whole bunch of different things. And only you, I think, as the entrepreneur, can really know 
what type of people you need to connect with to support that business idea. The other category, uh, the second category is the personal side of it. So entrepreneurship is, is a serious challenge and there's a lot of emotional ups and downs. So to find those people uh, out in the world that can support you on a sort of emotional, personal level, I think is also really important to nurture and build. And the third is, is the talent or the, um, the team network. So you, like you said, you need to be working with people who are um, smarter than you and who really understand the technical aspects of whatever you're trying to do. And so I, I've seen, I think, a lot of people neglect that aspect of the network and um, seen it be detrimental to companies and to myself in terms of hiring. So I think if you try to really relate to those people and foster that network of technical people that can support your business, I think that's important as well. Perfect. We, we're going to have to open to Q&A from the audience, but very quickly, I just would like a line from each of you. Uh, what advice would you give a, a would-be entrepreneur? Let's start with you. You want me to start with Tom? He's, he seems ready. Yeah. Go for it, Tom. I think it's just about being a hustler. Beautiful. Uh, I, I think it's about adding real value to real people. I think it's about being data-driven uh, and, and letting that guide the way, not your personal opinions. And I think it's about finding people a whole hell of a lot smarter than you and actually listening to what they say. I would say don't try to out-Facebook Facebook or out-Google Google. Uh, you know, we, we try to look three years out. You know, it's kind of, we heard about the thunder lizards. I, I, I call it the, uh, the boiling frog. You know, most CEOs of large corporations are like the frog, and if you turn the temperature, you put a frog in water and turn the temperature up slowly, the frog will boil itself to death. And what we try to do with large corporations is we turn the water to boiling and throw the CEO in, and he jumps back out. And that's where we find the soft spots. And same thing for an entrepreneur. Think ahead of the game, not what's in the game. I would say find your passion and figure out how to make money. Uh, with your by 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 doing your passion, um, uh, I always had the uh, end result. Well, when I first started my company, my whole goal was to travel around the world and make money. And figure out how to now I got to figure out how to do that. Um, and uh, and then um, I would say drink a lots of Wansa's tequila, which will help you <laughs> generate those ideas and move forward. <laughs> Perfect, Ricardo. Yeah, I would say, uh, I second that. I think it's about validation uh, because sometimes uh, you, you say, oh yeah, I want this as a person and I want to align my business interests, my company's interests, my personal interests. But sometimes the idea is ahead of its time. So I would say as well, uh, validate. Don't get, don't get too married with that idea and just uh, hustle it. Thomas. So I would say, it's about realizing that we're essentially really smart, upright monkeys on a rock which is hurtling through space around a star. So what is it that you really need to give to the world? And think about your life in terms of how short it is relative to history of humanity. What is it that you, you want to give to the world? And find whatever that thing is that you must do and, and then just go start hustling and do it. Beautiful. Well, I, I ask for a big hand for our entrepreneurs and we'll open to you and I. here okay so um, since we are live streaming we're gonna have to breeze through the Q&A session but we want to take three questions uh, to any of the panelists as well as Mike Maples undersecretary has already left but uh, we can start we'll just take two questions have them answer and then we'll take we'll do two more questions after that we'll start right here Alice. Hi, good morning. My name is Alicia Guajardo. My company is about city design. And the question, it will be for Chance. And if you can um, share with us a little bit of your fundraising strategies for different cases. Um, in my particular case of my company, um, the people that fund my projects are uh, private clients sometimes. And sometimes I have uh, been receiving up to $1 million, for example, from Lorenzo Zambrano, that is the president of CEMEX. Uh, or I have been knocking the doors of the Inter-American Development Bank or the World Bank, but I would like uh, just to understand a little bit more what you do in terms of that kind of, of strategy and if we can find some like city lovers that can uh, like, give like one dollar per person or something like that. I don't know. Thank you. Let's, let's get another question and that way we get through the questions and you answer. Who's got another question? Right there. Hi, thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Rafael Canton. I'm the CEO of Caxon Media Group. 
And basically, we develop uh, video games and movies for uh, animation movies for uh, for kids. And um, we just was uh, nominated by the MTV LA as the best game of uh, 2012. Uh, but for the company, it's very difficult uh, all the funding, and the return on investment is uh, is a uh, long term. How did you do all this uh, funding the company? Uh, how do you develop all the the business going through until you really get a, a good amount of, of coming back uh, for the money. And is your question directed to one of the particular? No, 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 so to all of them because okay. ba basically it's a quite different business. All right, we'll let Chance start and then we'll let someone else take the second question. Sure, I guess I'll do a 30 second how to on raising a million dollars. Congrats on your company. Um, I, I would say a couple things. First of all, just fundraising strategy outside of crowdfunding, and then I'll touch on crowdfunding. Um, first of all, it, one of the big mistakes people make is they don't understand that successful fundraising is momentum driven, meaning you want to shape behavior uh, for yourself and for investors. And if you go out and you don't really have a clear open date and you know exactly what you want and you don't speak clearly to it and you don't already have a pool of people circled and you dribble along and you give yourself an unknown amount of time, that's going to be very difficult. So you should create the opposite situation of that. First, you need to build relationship with investors a long time prior to ever asking them for money. Um, so there's a, a, a VC that I know in, in uh, LA who's successful, Mark Schuster from GRP, and he, he actually distills this down to a theory that he shares with entrepreneurs that he says, create lines, not dots in investors' minds. You're a dot if you show up in a pitch meeting, first time meeting someone or the second time, and you say, hey, here's what I'm doing, here's my story, blah, blah, blah. Are you interested in investing? Like, you mean nothing to that person. They have no relationship, there's no trust. So create a relationship with investors like they're actually real people. I know it sounds a little crazy. Um, and create a narrative about your progress. Show up and tell them, here's the things I'm gonna do over the next three months. I'm gonna get in touch with you. I might even just send you an email. You don't have to respond, but I'll check in with you on a, a monthly basis for the next three months while I'm closing this round and jumping in any time. That makes you different than 98% of entrepreneurs that they come apart, and it makes it easy for them to start to say, huh, this person actually gets stuff done and meets their goals. So that's the first. The second is don't just try and get yourself in the door. Uh, one of the most valuable things you can do is to not have to refer yourself. Uh, so there's a great rule called the rule of threes. If you can get two or three people to introduce you or talk about you or refer you to someone, then you don't have to validate yourself. You don't have to sit there and tell your story and try and get them to think that you're smart enough they already find you credible, if those are credible people that referred you. So that's a function of having already built your network. Um, and so that takes some legwork. Um, so to spin really quickly, and I'll try and make this short, to crowdfunding. Crowdfunding is an accelerant and puts a magnifier on those good things that should already be happening in your business. Um, and so what we do is bring a couple of things, part, some of which is new. Uh, crowdfunding has three main areas of success. There's your pitch and plan. Uh, which should be credible, that should be about you, your management team, your story of success, your narrative, and how you're going to get there. Uh, and then there's the social capital, which relates to some of the stuff I was talking about. So who endorses you, who are your advisors, what's your background and experience, and who's on your team? And then third, which is new about the crowdfund investing that we're doing is, what is the offer? What is in it for an investor? What is the investment return? So those are the three key pieces. So I think if, if you could spend some time thinking about each of those areas, it, it's almost guaranteed that you're going to have success. Who wants to tackle the second question? It was just generally about fundraising, is that right? So I would say that I probably had the door slammed in my face over a thousand times uh, before Mike Maples finally invested. Um, you know, I think, you know, a lot of it for me was um, you know, there was a guy that, that came to uh, speak at, at my school. I was at the University of Texas. I was studying business, and he started a company called, like, Michelangelo's, which does, like, like frozen food and stuff. And um, he said, there's always an investor out there for everyone. And I thought that that was a really compelling statement because, you know, when you have the door slammed in your face a thousand times, you're like, okay, that's kind of the only thing that keeps you going, right, is that there's at least one investor out there for you. Um, you know, and then I sort of, you know, dropped out of school and 
said, I'm going to go figure out this Silicon Valley thing. And I uh, had the, you know, great opportunity to meet Mike, who, you know, then subsequently introduced me to Reed and, you know, had a lot of really great, you know, opportunities. And in fact, the first time I met Mike, I think we actually got in an argument. Um, but it was kind of awesome. Um, and, uh, you know, beyond that, you know, we went out for our, our last round of funding, our Series A, and we actually, you know, leveraged crowdfunding for our own round. Um, and that was probably one of the most interesting experiences I think I probably ever had in my life. And we used a platform called uh, Angels List, which, you know, is real disruptive. And, you know, as a company and, and people in our space were just sort of mavericks. Uh, and Mike's certainly a, a maverick uh, in, in the Valley as well. Uh, we decided, well, let's, we're going to go raise some money. Let's, let's throw this thing up on Angel's List. Let's, let's give Naval a call and let's see what happens. And like literally within, you know, probably about an hour of launching, hundreds of emails started pouring into my inbox and we ended up raising about $8 million in a week. And it ended up being sort of the largest online funding round, Series A, um, that had come out of this kind of whole thing. And I think probably what ended up, and a lot of it, you know, has to do with uh, momentum, having the right people on your team, as well as having a great story. And I think, you know, you bring all those three different things together, um, and I think you will end up having a successful fundraising round. Uh, but it's different for every stage uh, as well, too. So if it's a seed stage, you just can't find somebody that's willing to lose a lot of money. Um, you know, Series A, Series B, it gets a little bit safer, but not much safer, right? I mean, the likelihood of getting to a Series A is extremely difficult. Getting to a Series B and maybe even having an outcome is extremely rare. Uh, so it's just really understanding those things and, and not taking it too, too harshly. All right, thank you guys. Let's give these guys a big hand. Thank you, Marcus.